Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined for a second time by Dr. Lisa Bortolotti. She is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Birmingham, affiliated with the Philosophy Department in the School of Philosophy, Theology and Religion, and also with the Institute for Mental Health in the School of Psychology. In our first interview, we talked about her book, The Epistemic Innocence of Irrational Beliefs, and I'm leaving a link to that down below in the description. And today we're talking about her latest book, Why Delusions Matter. So Dr. Bortolotti, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure to everyone. It's a very pleasure to come back. So let's start perhaps with the most basic question here. So what are delusions? Okay, so in part the book is an attempt to answer that question, although um, what I'm trying to do in the book is to say that instead of asking what delusions are as if um, there's something out there that we don't necessarily interact with, um, maybe we should ask that question by thinking about what we do with delusions. There's the same approach that some people take to the notion of belief. So instead of giving a definition of belief in terms of what a belief is, a mental state with certain characteristics, what you do is just think about what we do with beliefs. And basically what we do with beliefs is we attribute them to other people so that we can explain what they do and predict what they will do next. So I'm adopting exactly the same uh, strategy to the question what delusions are. So I'm saying that delusions are the kind of um, belief that we attribute to people when um, we are in this context of interpretation. But of course, there are certain features that delusions have that not all beliefs share. And I'm identifying those features. Now, traditionally, uh, as you know, in the in philosophical and psychological literature, delusions are very often defined in terms of irrationality. So they are defined in terms of irrational beliefs, so beliefs supported by evidence, in terms of irrational beliefs, so beliefs supported by evidence, they are not particularly responsive to evidence. And they also have like an unusual content or anyway a false content that in some cases can be also unusual. And in the more clinical definitions, of course, they are associated with certain um, conditions um, that um, like, like schizophrenia or dementia. Um, and that implies, of course, that delusions are a symptom as well. So if you, you know, are looking for a general kind of traditional definition, delusions are um, reports that people make, um, often considered to be their beliefs. Um, they make this report with high conviction. Um, other people tend to think that those uh, beliefs are not well supported by evidence and they are resistant to counter evidence and very often delusions are thought to be symptoms of mental health conditions that are diagnosed by psychiatrists. Um, the thing that I do in the book is to say, okay, let's think more carefully about what we do when we call a belief delusional and then see what are the features that we find. And in some cases, I kind of go along with the traditional definition. In other cases, I want to resist some assumptions that we make when we think that a belief is delusional. And so you mentioned there are several different criteria that people commonly use to classify certain beliefs as delusional, like, for example, the fact that they are not supported by the evidence, that they are irrational, that they are symptoms of certain particular mental disorders, for example. But what are, do you have a particular set of criteria that you use in the book to classify beliefs as delusional? Yeah, so um, if you look at a good sample, a varied sample of definitions of delusions, there are about two or three things that you find. So people think about the relationship um, between the belief and the evidence. So for instance, they say it's resistant to counter evidence. People think about the relationship between the belief and the world. So they say it's false or it's bizarre. Um, and people think about 
in some cases, not in all definitions, but in some definitions, people think about the consequences of having that particular belief. And often they describe these uh, consequences as costly. So it's it's not a good thing <laughs> to have a delusional belief. Um, so they talk about the delusion, for instance, being disruptive or affecting functioning or affecting well-being in a negative way. Um, so in a sense, because my project is to kind of capture what people think when they think about delusion, I didn't want to be too revolutionary. So I wanted to be conservative and I'm keeping these categories in the book. So I talk about the relationship between delusion and the evidence, the relationship between delusions and the world, and also whether delusions can be considered to have consequences that are negative. But I also expand a little bit um, these criteria. So I also talk about the relationship between the belief and the self, so the, the idea of identity. And I also talk about the consequences of delusions that may not be negative, so whether there are any um, positive consequences of having delusion. So the criteria that I'm adopting are to be thought of as criteria for the attribution of delusionality. So when you say something to me that not only seems to me to be not quite right, but I'm wondering, oh, why is Ricardo thinking that? How come, you know? Um, that triggers a certain type of response. So if your belief is implausible to me, if it looks like it's quite central to how you see the world or you see yourself, and if it is quite unshakable, so it's difficult for me to persuade you that your belief is not right, then I think we've got a good set of epistemic criteria for attributions of delusionality. In addition to that, you th can think of criteria that are not strictly speaking epistemic. So I may wonder, oh, is a good thing for Ricardo to think that? Or is a good thing for society if Ricardo thinks that? So there I may play with other notions. I may ask whether the delusion is a pathological belief, whether it is harmful, whether it has any particular meaning for you or for, um, for the people around you, for instance. And in this case, in, in the book, I argue that delusions are not pathological. They can be harmful, but very often they're not the origin of the harm. And that um, they very often have meaning, not only for the person reporting them, but also if they are shared in a, in a self-defined social group for other people in that group. Um, so those are the kind of criteria that I'm thinking about. And so delusions are beliefs, but are they nothing but beliefs? I mean, can they be something beyond or something more than just beliefs? That's an excellent question and a difficult one to answer. So um, in my previous work, um, I've spent a lot of time arguing that delusions can be seen as beliefs. So I'm often associated with toxicism about delusion. Uh, and in doing that, I have, of course, tried to argue against uh, other philosophers, psychologists, psychiatrists who think of delusions in different ways. Maybe they think of them as experiences. They think of them of ways of seeing the world. They think of them as narratives and so on. There are many options out there. Now, my view is not um, that delusions are nothing but beliefs. Uh, and I try to explain that in, in one of the initial chapters of the book. My view um, is that delusions play a lot of different roles. And that's part of why it is so difficult to define them. And it's so difficult to confine the notion of delusion to some key examples, right? Because lots of different things can be called delusions. Um, one key aspect, though, of delusion for me is this idea of investment, which leads us to belief. So according to me, for, you know, for an interpreter who is listening to a speaker um, saying something quite outrageous, according to the interpreter, if the interpreter is inclined to describe what is happening as the speaker having a delusion, that's because the speaker seems to be sincere in that report, genuinely um, convinced that what they're saying is true, right? If there is no sense of 
sincerity and commitment, I think we wouldn't call that a delusion. Maybe we would be thinking something different, like maybe the speaker is joking or is provoking us or, you know, uh, there are lots of things that we do with words that are not reporting beliefs. But I think that the moment that we attribute delusionality is because we believe that the speaker um, is trying to convey something that they are uh, committed to. So this sense of investment for me is quite central to what a delusion is. And that leads us naturally to the notion of belief. But that, of course, shouldn't be taken too rigidly, I think. You know, in, in the case of delusion, especially in the clinical literature, but also outside the clinical literature, you may have cases where at some point in time, the person is very strongly committed to that particular content. So you can say quite confidently that's a belief that the person has and the person is defending it with arguments and so on. At other points in time, it may be that the person is merely considering that as a hypothesis or um, is kind of suspending judgment about it or the conviction anyway is fading. Uh, maybe it's a period of transition where they are starting to realize that there is a lot of evidence against the belief and they're trying, you know, they're starting to be moved by that. So definitely I wouldn't say that, you know, delusions, each each thing that we call delusion is a belief all the way or, or, or it's a typical belief. But definitely this idea of investment and commitment is quite important to understand the phenomenon. And in the book, I use a number of different kind of metaphors to describe what delusions do. Uh, and of course, they're not all original. They come from the literature. But, you know, this idea of delusions as maps or delusions as stories. And sometimes, you know, if you think of delusions just as beliefs, you, you lose the sense of all the other things that delusions are doing, because sometimes we use delusion to navigate the world that is becoming very confusing for us. So that's the idea of a map. And sometimes we use delusions to tell a story about ourselves that makes sense to ourselves and other people, almost like justifying or interpreting what is happening to us. And that, again, the notion of belief doesn't completely capture that. Mm -hmm. And another thing that is very interesting to explore here is, so we people tend to classify certain unusual beliefs as delusion, but not delusional, but not others. Do we know why, do you know why we do that? Why is it that uh, we look at certain unusual beliefs and we say, oh, those are delusions, but then we look at others and no, those aren't really delusions. Yeah, you're right. I think I think this question was really what was motivating me to, to start with. You know, how is it that only some of the things that we don't particularly share with other people, we tend mm -hmm. to be the delusional and others not. And I think there are a number of things that we can look at. Um, again, it's a very good question with a very difficult answer. So. We can look at things like this. So sometimes we disagree with people on important issues, maybe issues that have to do with politics, have to do with how we see our life or the things that are important in our life. But we don't necessarily take disagreement to be a sign that the other person is out of their mind or delusional because we admit of the possibility of disagreement in that particular context and we kind of see why the person can think what they are thinking even if we don't completely share their perspective. I think the case of delusion is a case where that kind of thing is disrupted. So we hear someone saying something that we would never say in our right mind. Um, and we get this sense that how can they say that? So we lack an understanding of the way that they have come to believe that that's the case. And I think that is what triggers almost kind of unconsciously, automatically. I mean, it's not something that we kind of really think about in any detail, um, but it triggers this reaction of saying, oh, wow, that's that's not just kind of false or different, that's that's a delusion, right? So there is this sense that we feel that something is wrong. Either we can't identify potential reasons that the person has to say what they're saying, or we think that what they are saying doesn't really fit with other things that we know about that person or that we know about how the world works. And so there is this sense where we come to think of that particular person as maybe 
there being something wrong with them or them not having really kind of agency or rationality in a sense in which we would normally assume the people talking to us and engaging with us in a debate to have that kind of background of rationality and agency. So that that's the story, right? That's the official story, I think, about what is it that the delusion does. It makes us doubt that the other person is actually interacting with us in the way we would expect. And I, I mean, you can see the old book as an attempt to challenge that. I want to say, look, you know, we do react in that way, but maybe, you know, our reaction is not really a sign that the other person has lost their agency and rationality. It's just a sign that we don't know enough about the person to actually reconstruct what their story is, what their reasons might be. And to answer your question in, in a fairly convoluted way, I think that very often the heuristic that we use, you know, when we talk to each other, and um, they make us think that's a delusion, have a lot to do with unfamiliarity. So we tend to ascribe delusion when something is unfamiliar to us, not necessarily when something is implausible, because, you know, there are lots of beliefs that I think are very, very deeply implausible beliefs about for instance women not being as good as men or or beliefs about um you know certain people being kind of uh, inferior or or us wanting us to dismiss them because of certain aspects of their identity that are deeply um unreasonable they're not based on evidence we know that you know we would call them prejudices but because they're so common in our society unfortunately we don't tend to think of them as delusions. We don't tend to think, oh, you know, that person is out of their mind. Um, and, uh, and there are other beliefs that instead, you know, are quite unusual. Like if someone were to say, OK, that's, that chair is trying to communicate something to me. You know, that's that's a belief that we don't share, but also triggers something different in us, a reaction of saying, OK, there's something wrong going on here. Um, you know, maybe there is a pathology, maybe there is insanity and so on. And that's not triggered by other types of beliefs like prejudices. And I think very often it's the familiarity factor that plays a very important role in how we react. And so going back to one of the criteria we talked about earlier, I mean, when there are sets of criteria, many times philosophers talk about necessary or sufficient conditions. There is, we have the list, but perhaps a few of them uh, have necessarily to be present for something, in this case, to be a delusion. And there are other instances where they talk about sufficient conditions, where if that a single condition is present, then it's immediately a delusion. It doesn't really matter if there, the others are there or not. So when it comes to something, uh, a belief being false or not supported by the evidence, do you think that uh, that criterion by itself is a necessary or sufficient condition to classify something as a delusion? Excellent uh, question again. So um, many people working in the philosophy of medicine and the philosophy of psychology tend to resist this idea of definitions or criteria as providing necessary and sufficient conditions because the subject matter that they work with is um, quite uh, elusive. And so it is very difficult in some contexts to be able to offer necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, and, you know, people are very candid about this. Even when they propose a new definition of delusion, they do say, you know, there are things that, you know, we may want to call delusion that lack some of these criteria that I thought would be necessary for a delusion and, and so on. And indeed, you know, even the famous DSM definition of delusion, so the definition of delusion that you find in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, even that one that is considered to be the point of reference for everybody, you know, people just find counterexamples or find situations that seem to fit perfectly the definition, and yet they're not situations where you talk about having a delusion. So the bar here is not very high because people recognize that it's difficult to do that, to provide necessary and sufficient conditions. Now, in my project, 
I want to be able to offer something like, and I underline uh, something like, necessary and sufficient conditions for attributions of delusionality. So not for something to be a delusion, but when is it that an interpreter is tempted to say you are delusional to a speaker? And in that context, when I look at the epistemic features, I say that implausibility, unshakability, and centrality to identity are um, unnecessary and jointly sufficient for the epistemic notion of delusion. But then, you know, of course, there is a huge question mark. The epistemic notion of delusion may be not enough. We may want to add something about the perception that the delusion is dangerous or costly or harmful. I think that's very embedded in our uh, common uh, conception of delusion. So that would become a, a necessary condition as well. Um, but one thing that I say in the book is that all of these notions that I'm using, being harmful, being meaningful, being unshakable, being um, uh, implausible, admit of degrees. And so you may find that actually two things, two attributions of delusionality, they share all of those criteria, look very different from one another because something can be huge impl implausible and something can be just slightly implausible. So there is a lot of variation in how you actually apply those criteria. And normally that would be a weakness, I think, of an account because, you know, you can make it almost unfalsifi unfalsifiable. But I think in, in this very complex uh, context where we're dealing with people's beliefs, people's ways of thinking about themselves, um, that's kind of okay because people do recognize and in some sense delusion is a family resemblance term. You know, it's not something that is an on-off notion that you can apply uh, or fa fail to apply to a specific belief, but it's something that, you know, um, people are even doubtful whether it is a, a useful notion to use just because it has been stretched so much by all these different definitions. So I think it's a lively debate. I don't think, you know, I'm giving a conclusive answer to what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for attributions of delusionality. I just want to contribute with that debate by kind of adding something that maybe wasn't there before or commenting on things that have been proposed before and I think can be slightly improved or changed. And do you make a distinction between different types of delusion? So, for example, earlier we mentioned that some delusions are the result of mental disorders and others are not. So, for, uh, for example, do, we, do you distinguish between those two types or not? Okay, so in the book I do something quite uh, controversial. Um, which is, I don't distinguish between the clinical and non-clinical context. Mm -hmm. That's probably justifiable by the fact that I'm interested in the lay concept of delusion and how we attribute delusionality to people. So um, I'm playing with a notion that is already out there. And one thing that I noticed at the very beginning is that we don't reserve the phrase, you are delusional to people with a mental health condition or even a psychiatric diagnosis. Right. We um, and we have been using it a lot um, during the pandemic when we were commenting or reflecting on different types of conspiracy beliefs that were being raised. And indeed, we find that use in the press um, quite widespread. I'm not defending it. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just observing that that's what we find. So, for instance, uh, the word delusional has been used to characterize climate change denialism, which is obviously not a clinical um, condition. Um, we tend to use the word delusional to describe uh, beliefs in alien abduction, even if that's not associated with a psychiatric diagnosis. Um, whether it should be, you know, it's a debate, but the, the idea is that we actually use the word delusion in much broader ways. You can even think about, you know, the book, The God Delusion. I mean, it wasn't about a mental illness. It was about a different type of phenomenon. So I'm, I'm, I'm following that use. I'm trying to. So in the context of the book, although I offer examples from the clinical context and from um, non-clinical context, I tend to talk about all of these things as delusions. Do you think that people that might argue that the term delusion might be a little bit problematic to use here because it has a negative connotation to it might have a point or not? Yes, 
I, I have encountered this reaction many times in my work. As you can imagine, many people um, have raised this objection. Why are we still talking about delusion? Delusion is clearly a stigmatized term. And in the book, I do uh, talk about some evidence that has been gathered recently about how stigmatizing the word delusion is. So when people are presented with uh, the same story about a person, if the word delusion is used in one version of the story, they tend to give very different judgments about the behavior of that person than if the word delusion is not used. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to trivialize this concern. I think it's an important concern and it's something I think about every day when I when I use the word delusion. I think um, the word delusion, like many other terms uh, that have been associated with poor mental health, have been stigmatized and they're associated with, uh, for instance, things that have nothing to do with delusions like uh, violence or dangerousness and so on. Um, yet I make a conscious decision to use the word because I think that would be very difficult to capture otherwise. Um, in doing that, I also try to kind of revise uh, the, the associations that are made uh, with a particular world. So I do recognize that at the moment, as we use it, delusion is associated with implausibility and shakeability, uh, centrality to identity. And other things like being pathological, like being harmful in a way that uh, suggests that the delusion is the source of the harm, uh, being a, a denial of agency or a clear sign that agency is failing. And I reject the last three. So um, I say that we should not view delusion in a pathological way. Uh, we have no good reason of doing that based on science. I say that we should not think of delusion as necessarily being the source of the harm. Very often it's a response to something that is already harmful, that is happening to the person, like a crisis. And I say that we should not think of it as a failure of agency. At least that's reductive because um, my view is that delusions at the same time undermine and support agency. So it's a much more complicated story. So um, think about, I just want to give you an example. Think about the word mad, right? The word mad has been used in very negative ways and many people have stopped using it because it's stigmatizing. But now the mad movement, uh, the mad pride, for instance, has reclaimed that notion, has made it into something different, right? Has made it into something that has very positive connotations as well as, you know, uh, reflecting some uh, complexities um, in the relationship between individuals and society. So in a way, I don't think that the use of a word that has been stigmatizing is always problematic. I think we should think about it. You, we should definitely do it in a way that is reflective. It's not like um, um, kind of um, a default use. It's, it's something that you know, we think about and we make a conscious decision to use it or not to use it. And in the case of delusion, my conscious decision is to use it. I may change my mind, like if, you know, this attempt that I'm making to um, make it much less stigmatizing and depathologizing delusion, it fails, then it may be that we get to a point where, you know, the best thing to do is to stop using it. But the thing is, we do need words to describe the kind of things that happen when we interact with other people. And at the moment, I think delusion does describe something quite special. So let's get now into some more of the cognitive science behind delusions here. So the title of your book is Why Delusions Matter. So why do they matter, actually? What can we learn more broadly about human cognition by studying them? OK. So um, for most of my academic career, um, I've been focusing on why delusions matter for cognition, for the way in which we understand human rationality and human agency. Um, and my, uh, I'm not going to talk about that because it's in the past, but, um, you know, just as a background, my view has been that the presence of delusion does not signal a, a failure of intentionality. We can still interact uh, with people who report delusional belief in the same way in which we interact with people who report other types of belief. 
we don't need to think necessarily of them as uh, brains with a glitch or machines to be fixed. Um, there is something uh, that we can say about the delusion being embedded in a narrative that they have about themselves and their experiences and not being meaningless or uh, just signs of pathology. The book is definitely built on that view, but it goes beyond that view because in the book I'm interested in why delusions matter, not just for human cognition, teaching us how we think and what maybe types of rationality or irrationality are um, relevant to, to our behavior, but also teaches us something about how we interact with each other and how we should interact with each other. So I take delusions to be important here, not just in the sphere of cognition, but also in the sphere of something that is emerging quite powerfully in philosophy, kind of political epistemology. You know, um, our beliefs are not just some things that represent the way in which we see the world. They are actually part of ourselves, part of our way of presenting ourselves to other groups, to other people, part of the way in which kind of society tries to um, make sense of what is happening to people who believe different things and, and people who have to make decisions together, even if they believe different things about themselves and the world. And one thing that we have observed, and I think at every point in, in history, but I think have become really salient in the last few years, is how a crisis that involves everybody, literally everybody globally, um, can um, really emphasize the fact that uh, collective decision making is extremely difficult when there is polarization. And one of the reasons why that's the case is that we tend to pathologize people who believe different things from us. So when I'm talking to someone who believes that uh, COVID-19 was a hoax, for instance, um, a very natural reaction, but I think a reaction we should resist, is to say, oh, there's no point talking to them because they're not amenable to reason. There is nothing I can say or I can do to persuade them that things are not that way. Um, and, and to me, that's the typical reaction we have with someone who reports something that we think of as a delusion, right? So we don't just think, okay, what they're saying is not true. We go much beyond that, right? We say what they say is something that disqualifies them from being a participant in this conversation, or at least an equal participant in this conversation. And we've seen this everywhere, you know, this counseling, this, you know, I'm not talking to you, um, there is no nothing I can do for you, and, and so on. And I think that's bad. I think that's that's not the right reaction to these kind of situations. And I think the case of delusion teaches us exactly that. So that's why the study of delusion matters. It makes it very relevant that even something that initially may sound completely crazy, out of this world, having no good reason for it, can make a lot of sense when we have some background information about why the person is reporting that, when we know what the story behind that report is, when we know what kind of experiences in life that person had. And the classic example for me is the delusion of persecution, which in recent years has been associated with adverse experiences in childhood, such as bullying and child abuse and, and, and other forms of actual persecution, where the persecution is not a delusion, is actually something that happens to the person. Immediately makes you realize that what sounds like a delusion of persecution, so this person thinks that people are hostile to them, even if that's not the case, maybe actually a very good inductive inference that they are making given the type of life that they've lived and the type of interactions that they've had with other people. So a little bit of information about what has happened to them, a little bit of context, you know, not just taking the delusion as one quote of one sentence in one kind of clinical case, but considering what the person is like um, and every conversation with them that go beyond the scope of the delusion, I think is absolutely essential. So if that helps us understand why the person comes up with that implausible belief, 
Why shouldn't we adopt a similar attitude to people we disagree with on political or ideological grounds, right? So maybe there is a reason why um, they are, for instance, uh, very suspicious about uh, official uh, sources of information, why they don't believe in science, and so on. And indeed, in the literature on conspiracy theories, many people have noticed that the social aspects are super important, and that very often people who are uh, very inclined to adopt conspiracy theories are people who have been historically and traditionally marginalized, not listened to, and their interests haven't been taken into consideration. So they actually have a very good reason not to trust um, you know, the government or the scientific community um, if they come and impose an explanation that is not accessible to them and is not made um, to fit with how they see the world and how they see themselves. And so what are delusions a response to? In what conditions do people develop delusional beliefs? Okay, so um, different delusions are a response to different things. Mm -hmm. um, um, the typical case that you find, for instance, in the clinical literature is when the person has um, something that can be described as a neurobiological deficit that causes them to have um, a perceptual experience that is anomalous. So that could be, for instance, hearing voices when there is nobody there talking or seeing things that, that are not there. Um, now, in that particular case, uh, you can imagine someone having that experience and not being able to understand what is going on. And you can also imagine the delusion emerging as a possible explanation of what is happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I hear the voice, I don't see anybody, maybe, I don't know, it's someone talking to me via the fridge or is God asking me to do something for them and so on. Um, so the explanation, as, as Conrad was saying, becomes a revelation. Uh, I've been confused for a very long time because I'm having all these experiences that other people do not share and they feel very salient to me, very important to me. I don't know what to do with them. The delusion emerges as a potential explanation that put, ev fits everything together in a way that you know makes sense to me and comes with some kind of relief. So it's like, okay, now, now I know. Now, now I'm not going to be puzzled anymore by this. So that's one uh, case where uh, the delusion can be seen as a response. There are other cases where the delusion is a response to very either traumatic or adverse experiences that people have. So for instance, people who have been neglected all their lives, maybe by their parents as well, the people they should get uh, support from, um, people who have never been singled out for anything positive, they develop a very kind of um, negative conception of themselves um, and, you know, maybe one day start believing that someone really important is in love with them, like in erotomania. So this kind of delusion is, is, is a response in the sense that it gives them back a sense that they are important, that they are in control, that there is something they can do for themselves and, and so on. Um, so that's another case. In, where you can see some clear connections between a person's experience and the formation of the delusion. In non-clinical cases, I think the delusion is often either a reaction to situations where your self-esteem has been damaged, I think that applies as well. Um, like in some cases of, for instance, um, unrealistic optimism, where I might think, you know, I'm amazing in something, even if I've got really negative feedback from other people, because I need to believe that I can do something, or I can achieve something, that's something that um, helps me psychologically. Or even cases where something um, very puzzling or difficult to understand happens like during the pandemic from one day to the next you know you cannot go to work and you know that you cannot see people and there is no obvious um, explanation that comes from official sources because maybe scientists haven't worked out yet what this virus is how it is transmitted and you know where it came from and so on so there is this gap right of explanation you don't have one, uh, you may go 
uh, onto the internet to look for what people are saying and maybe there is some interesting engaging explanation that catches your eye. He may not be the best explanation in terms of being funded on evidence, but it's something that fills that gap. It makes your anxiety just diminish because, oh, now you think you know what is going on. Um, so again, you know, the kind of thing that triggers uh, the, the, the delusion may be uh, different for different people, for different contexts. But in the sense in which I intend the delusion, it's important to understand that all of us have delusions. It's just that we don't think of them as delusions when we think of our own beliefs. Uh, we need to hear someone else's perspective to hear the word delusion associated with those things. But we all have things that we believe very strongly, even if we don't have a lot of evidence for them, maybe not a lot of independent evidence anyway, um, that we would never give up. Um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, they, they clash with other things that people believe or they clash with kind of uh, the orthodoxy or whatever that comes from and so on. So I think that's the sense of delusion that I'm working with, uh, which is primarily a reaction to something that destabilizes you. Um, you. You lose your stability in some sense as an epistemic agent and you need some kind of explanation to be able to feel that you are again in control of what is happening to you. Earlier in our conversation, at a certain point, you mentioned briefly personal identity. So in what ways are delusions tied to and might contribute to personal identity? So this is a one aspect of the book that is a little bit new. Uh, with respect to other things that have been written about delusion. And it's also a part that is quite speculative and tentative uh, just because it's it's new. But one thing that has always um, struck me about how uh, people with lived experience of clinical delusions and, and clinicians as well tend to think of delusion as something that absorbs the person's attention. You know, maybe starts as something really small um, and then it becomes bigger and bigger. And there is a point where almost everything that happens to the person is seen through the lens of the delusion. And, and this strikes me also um, as something that can be said, of course, uh, in, in slightly different ways, about people who are maybe in the grip of a cons conspiracy theory that, you know, the conspiracy theory may start as something that, oh, I've heard that, you know, there is this theory around, maybe you're not even sure that it's true. But, you know, it can become something that um, really changes the way you see uh, the world, the, the way you distribute trust uh, among the people that you talk to or the institutions that you have to deal with. So this was something that I wanted to explain in some way. And the best way I could do it is to think of delusions as identity beliefs. So they are, uh, I mean, now, people use the word identity, the phrase identity belief in different ways. So of course I need to explain what I mean by that. But one sense of it is, first of all, delusion tend to be um, about the self. Not all beliefs that we call delusional are beliefs about the speaker who makes the report, right? Sometimes they are completely different things. They're about how the world is made or what God is about and, and so on. But the thing is, they always seem to have some kind of important repercussions on the speaker. And if it is a story, even if the speaker is not the center of the story, it tends to be one of the leading characters of that story. So I just uh, often talk about this beautiful um, um, uh, recount of, of delusions by Roberta Payne, who, who had schizophrenia, and uh, she at some point believed that the aliens forces were invading the earth and replacing people by people, um, uh, so that she realized that, you know, some of the individuals she was meeting in the streets were not humans, but they were aliens. And she kept saying, you know, the other people don't see that. You know, I'm the only one who is realizing what's happening. So even in this story that has nothing to do specifically with her, because it's about alien forces and invasion and replacement and so on, um, she, is, uh, she has a special role. So she believes she's the only one who sees this happening. And she also believes to be in danger because of this. So she believes the alien forces uh, mean to harm her. And for that reason, she gets away for, from her family because she doesn't want them to get involved. So. 
there is a sense in which the belief becomes important to you, to how you see yourself, uh, but also to what you do in your life. So the decisions that you make in your life and so on. And the notion of identity belief seems to capture that. So um, you can have different senses of identity. So you can think about your social identity as being, uh, I don't know, a professor or a mother or so on. But there are also things that um, you associate with yourself because, I don't know, you feel particularly proud about or, you know, you didn't kind of give them up very easily and they kind of reflect who you are and what you are about. And, you know, if you're thinking about how to present yourself to the world, that's the belief that you'd use. Something like, uh, for instance, being a feminist could be something that is part of your identity or being a Christian or being, um, I don't know, someone who believes in science and so on. So those kind of things are not just things that you believe, but they're things that convey a lot of information about yourself that um, you are happy to identify with. And I feel the delusions sometimes behave like that. Uh, again, some may start out like that and some may become identity beliefs in time. And I think that in part explains why um, they are unshakable, why it's difficult for us to give them up because identity beliefs, I mean, one, one important feature of identity beliefs is that they're not impossible to change. Of course, we've got the case of conversion, which is exactly a case where we change an identity belief, but they're very difficult to, uh, to change. And the reason why they're very difficult to change is that uh, when you change them, you have to change lots of other things about yourself. Um, so, um, like if you start, for instance, um, believing in uh, climate science after having been a climate change denialist, it's not just one belief that you need to change that, you know, climate, ch cl climate change is, is really happening. You have to change the way in which you assess evidence. So the evidence that was coming from climate science that you first thought was fabricated or was propaganda or whatever. Now you have to think that is good science, that the results that they are describing are actually uh, reliable. So it's a lot of kind of other assumptions that you change about the way in which the world works. Do you look at delusions as mostly an individual phenomenon or a social phenomenon? Because, of course, I mean, in more individualistic societies as the ones we live in, people tend to look at uh, perhaps a psychological phenomena that, that occur in people's minds as being the result of particular individual traits that people have, like for example, in the case of suffering from some kind of mental disorder. Uh, but uh, since people, since we are also part uh, of a particular social epistemic environment and we have social identities and all of that, to what extent would you say delusions might be a social phenomenon? That's a very, very timely question because I think we are experiencing uh, a change, a turn in, in the philosophy of delusions. Um, as you know, the philosophy of delusions was primarily an individualistic enterprise where people were seeing um, having the delusion as something that had to do with a particular individual and in particular the kind of deficits that this individual was having either at the level of perception or cognition or possibly both. Um, wasn't really seen very much as a social phenomenon, though, of course, there were aspects of the way in which the delusion is um, talked about or challenged that, that are social. So, for instance, when uh, people think about the DSM definition of delusion as a belief that is resistant to counter evidence, they also notice that there is a clause where it says, you know, um, actually uh, a subgroup um, a, a small community, it may not be a delusion, thinking about you know, the possibility of ruling out certain kinds of religious beliefs. So the social dimension was kind of there, um, but it wasn't prominent. People were thinking of delusion uh, primarily as something idiosyncratic to an individual. Um, I think this is changing. And it's changing because epistemology is changing. So again, you know, we used to think of uh, belief and knowledge, uh, things that had to do with, you know, one person, uh, what evidence that particular person had for a certain um, belief. Uh, 
Uh, but now we're thinking in terms of social epistemology and we know that what individuals think about um, and what kind of evidence they have depends on the environment in which they are. And it's not just the physical environment, it's the social environment, which people they talk to, what kind of assumptions they have about the reliability of testimony and so on. So there has been recently um, a lot of uh, research being done on the social uh, aspects of delusion. Uh, it has been done both by neuroscientists and philosophers and psychologists. So um, people have noticed how, for instance, we can think delusion, we can think of delusion as a problem that is not with one person's reasoning, but on the fact that that particular person doesn't trust the testimony of other people. So when other people say, look, it's not the fridge that is talking to you, you're just experiencing a certain type of hallucination, um, the person does not believe um, that particular testimony, even if it seems to come from a place of authority, which could be, for instance, a healthcare professional or so on. Um, so the kind of uh, focus has changed, I think, from focusing on reasoning deficits and biases to focusing much more on how we make knowledge in a group, in a collective. Um, and I think that's really important. It's a really welcome uh, development of, of the delusion literature that it's taking into account uh, the social dimension as opposed to uh, simply the, the, the dimension of the individual. I think because of the way in which I see um, belief in the context of interpretation, where you know there is always someone else who is listening to what you're saying, there is always a shared environment. Um, I think I've never really um, embraced individualism, uh, at least consciously, explicitly. It may be that in some formulations in the past, I mostly focused on you know the person having the delusion. But I, I do always see attributions of delusionality as a phenomenon that affects us all, um, just, just as attribution of belief. And therefore, there are lots of interesting things that we can think about in, in the way in which delusion is a social phenomenon. Um, I think this becomes even more obvious in the case of non-clinical delusions, where, of course, some of the beliefs that I uh, describe as delusional are beliefs that are held by lots of people, maybe in a, in a well-defined social group, in opposition to another, maybe majority group. Um, and certainly all the questions that we are asking about whether the delusion is supported by evidence, whether there is um, uh, kind of testimony for or against the delusion, assume a different kind of um, uh, dimension when we think about these social interactions, because of course the fact that a certain type of evidence comes from a certain place may be already reason to think of that evidence and not as not being um, something that we should consider just because we have certain beliefs about that particular source not being reliable or um, not having the same kind of methodological uh, conviction that, that we have um, and that we take to be a uh, criteria for, you know, doing good science or or um, providing good evidence. So I think the social dimension is really important. One thing I would observe is that we tend to um, think that the moment that we go social, we lose the pathological aspect of the delusion, and I haven't seen that very clearly in the literature. So one worry that I have is very often the going social means preserving the pathological um, dimension of delusion, and that's where I do, um, uh, push back. Um, because, um, you know, very often people say, oh, we shouldn't talk about reasoning abnormalities. Maybe we should talk about testimonial abnormalities, but it's still abnormalities that we're talking about. So I think I mean, a, a more profound and interesting revolution uh, would be to look at the social aspect with a view of um, seeing the dynamics as non-pathological, as something that is part of how we relate to each other. Uh, what would you say are some of the main costs and benefits, both for speakers and interpreters of delusions, and what are perhaps some of their potential harms? Yeah. So um, delusions can have obvious epistemic costs that we have already described, so I'm not going to go into that. But of course, if you believe something that is implausible or, um, or that other people don't think is supported by evidence, then you may 
uh, get a flawed uh, understanding of um, the, the world you live in, or you may not be able to coordinate with other people effectively and so on. So there is, of course, that. I think um, when people talk about disruption in the case of delusion, they do not refer just to the epistemic costs, though they talk about psychological costs and um, certain delusions are deeply unpleasant and they lead to actions that are uh, very harmful for the speaker. So uh, just to give you an example, delusion of guilt, when you think that everything that goes wrong in the world is your fault, may lead people to self-harm. Uh, we even think about uh, terminating their own lives. So um, there are obvious psychological um, consequences to having such a, such a delusion that should not be underestimated. One thing I would say is that in many cases, so in, in this particular case of the delusion of guilt, I think the harm comes from the content of the delusion. It's because you think that you are the problem that you want to harm yourself or um, terminate your life. But in many other cases, I think um, some of the harms that come from having the delusion um, are not just something that can be attributed to the content of the delusion, but maybe to other things that uh, accompany the delusion. So for instance, the fact that all of a sudden people don't listen to you anymore or exclude you um, may be a reason for, uh, for harm. So the kind of social isolation that comes from reporting a delusion that other people do not uh, agree with and they want to sanction may be you know a, an effect of having the delusion but it's not something that um, stems just from the content of the delusion is the reaction that people are having to the delusion um, so I think we should keep that in mind um, of course there are costs to the immediate social circle of the person who has the delusion uh, especially if the delusion is in the context of a mental health issue um, you know dealing with someone who believes something very uh, unusual that potentially harmful um, is of course is, is you, a huge a huge cost um, and I think in the non-clinical context some people have argued that apart from the epistemic costs of for instance conspiracy beliefs conspiracy beliefs are bad for society so they, they, there are people who argue, for instance, that uh, Lewandowski is a, is a case, that um, the emergence and uh, kind of um, difficulty in giving up conspiracy beliefs is uh, something that undermines democracy. That makes it very difficult for certain types of debates to happen in an environment that is conducive to people making good decisions for, for their own future. So there is this element where, you know, in some cases, um, a widespread delusion like a conspiracy belief that is shared by many people may actually have uh, consequences, political consequences, or even lead to violence. I think there is a huge debate about whether uh, conspiracy beliefs, conspiracy theories lead to um, protesting in a way that is more violent or aggressive than uh, otherwise. And I think there are arguments for and against. So I think the jury is still open, but it's certainly something to consider whether, you know, it's possible that a certain types of extremist beliefs, for instance, that give rise to violence can be considered delusional in some sense. Um, so that's that's a huge question mark. And ultimately, I think from a philosophical point of view, although the delusion is often an expression of ourselves, as I, I argued earlier, I think it also prevents us from achieving things that we consider important in our lives. So it may also be a problem for um, the full uh, manifestation of our agency. Um, and that is where, you know, the idea that the delusion is not something that we should always just tolerate, but maybe we should try and engage with in a kind of constructive uh, criticism way uh, emerges is because for the speaker themselves, you know, maybe the delusion is an explanation, but it's not the best explanation they could have. And so at a certain point in the book, you also talk about how delusions e exemplify the strengths of human cognition. Could you tell us about that? Yes. So um, I think in part we have touched on this idea that um, human cognition is to some extent frail. 
we don't often um, know what to do uh, about situations that are uh, characterized by uncertainty and that we haven't encountered before. And we may lack support, either social support or uh, all kind of psychological strength to try and maybe wait it out and see what happens and see what kind of theory emerges as triumphant after empirical tests and so on. Very often we have a need for closure and for certainty. We want answers and we want them fast because only if we do have those answers, we are able to act in the best possible way for ourselves and the people we care about. And I think, again, the pandemic has been a, an endless example of this kind of situations. I have to decide now whether I'm going to get a vaccine. People are still debating about whether there are any shortcomings in having the vaccine, whether the vaccine is effective. What do I do? Right? I need to act now. And yet, you know, I might not have a full explanation at my disposal. So the fact that we do come up with an explanation, I think, is an expression of agency, even when the explanation is not the best possible one that we could come up with. Um, because it's an expression of the fact that we are not just paralyzed by what happens to us, but we try to make sense of it. We take a more active role. And of course, taking an active role is a risk and it can misfire. Uh, and often, you know, when we endorse something that other people consider a delusion, that's not a good thing for us. But it may also be, in some circumstances, the only way to get out of an impasse or a critical situation, at least temporarily. Um, so one thing that I look at in the book is uh, amazing research that has been done by Belvedere Muri and colleagues on the insight paradox. So this idea that even people with schizophrenia when they start getting the touch from their delusion and recognizing that their belief may not actually have been true, experience very, very serious depression, often leading to suicidal thoughts as well. And so there is a sense in which there is a paradox. It's a good thing for them that they are no longer delusional, but the absence of the delusion leaves a gap that needs to be filled in some way because their standard default explanation is no longer available. And this causes them to feel very bad about themselves and their lives. Um, so um, what do we do, right? I mean, it's, it's I think clinically it's, it's, it's a dilemma. And uh, what people are proposing is that it's okay to challenge the delusional explanation, but you also have to provide psychological support that enables people to come up with a different explanation that makes them feel good about themselves and uh, gives them back the sense of agency that the delusion was maybe in an illusory way giving them. So that's the sense in which I think the delusion can be seen to support agency. So now for the last part of our conversation, let me ask you a few questions about some of the implications that these might have for social and political epistemology. So does your work on delusions in any way relate to work that people have been doing on disinformation? I think it is definitely related to that. Uh, I don't talk a lot in the book about this information um, because I'm not myself an expert on it. But when you're thinking about what kind of evidence you've got for the explanations that you come up with um, when you are faced with something unexpected, then, you know, information that comes from a number of different sources is one of the sources of evidence that you rely on. And when this information is, is there and it's widespread, uh, as we are experiencing um, with uh, the case of a more kind of globalized market of ideas, where you, know, you don't just hear your neighbor saying something unfounded, but you find maybe sometimes millions of people on the internet saying it, um, obviously it has an effect on how we form our beliefs and how we defend them and how unshakable they become. So I think this information is definitely relevant to the non-clinical cases of, uh, of beliefs that are attributed delusionality. And um, that is why my answer to what we do about delusion is not just, okay, you uh, try to get the person to see that there is another possible explanation. You actually make society such that 
those other types of explanation became life possibilities for that person because that person cannot be burdened with the responsibility of all reliable information about a number of things they may not know anything about to start with. Like in my case, you know, I don't know anything about epidemiology um, and yet I had to make decisions during the pandemic about what kind of behavior I was going to have. Um, so I think it's very important to structure society in such a way that uh, good reliable information is available easily, it's engaging, it's not kind of just a series of statistical facts that people switch off to immediately. Um, it's told in a narrative way, in a convincing way, in a way that makes sense to people. Um, and that this information is marked as such when that is possible. You know, that there are ways in which people don't have to make and don't have to make themselves the decision as whether a source is reliable or not, having very little grounds on the basis of which they could do it, but they're actually guided and supported in making those decisions. So I think, you know, this sense that yes, there is individual responsibility in the kind of beliefs and explanations that we form about the world, but we need to be supported by society because there is division of labor in society is very important to uh, what I come up with at the end of the book. So do you think then that it is possible for us to create epistemic environments that reduce the occurrence of delusional beliefs? Uh, yes and no. So I think um, I think delusional beliefs are part of how we um, interact with each other, interact with the world. So it will be difficult to um, eliminate them entirely. But it's the, um, definitely possible to create environments that make it easier for people to have a number of different explanations available to them and to make better decisions about which explanation to adopt. And I think most of these solutions will have to do with um, early years education. So um, getting children from a very early age to think about the world as something that can be explained in different ways, but also recognizing that not all explanations are equal and some explanations are better than others. And of course, I'm a philosopher, so I should say that, but these kind of critical thinking skills are super important and they can be uh, honed and acquired even later in life. But I think, you know, they are most effective when they are uh, part of uh, our life from the beginning, because that's the way in which we see the world and we start making sense of it. And if we have a sense that, you know, to manage this particular situation and navigate this very difficult circumstance, but I also need to make sure that what I come up with um, is a good map of the world, because otherwise I get lost, right? So the sense that, you know, not all maps of the world are equally good, all of them can give me a sense of um, kind of confidence and, and security, but sometimes it's false security and sometimes the sense of competency is illusory. So we need to maximize the opportunity for people to get maps that are actually useful in leading them where they want to go. Uh, earlier when we talked about uh, people's need for explanation and personal identity, for example, do you think that some of those needs that delusions fulfill can be uh, fulfilled by other alternatives? I mean, are there good alternatives that can fulfill those needs or are some of them only ever for fulfilled by delusions? So there may be circumstances in our lives where we are in such distress that the delusional option is the only one that is likely to get us through that particular phase. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it needs to be permanently that the default explanation for us. And I can definitely imagine some clinical cases where it's obvious that, you know, very little else, but something very close to the delusion would uh, restore um, enough uh, sense of you know, I can get out of this um, for, for the person to, to manage. Um, however, I think that there are things that we can do to um, reduce the appeal um, to explanations that make us feel 
amazing all the time, make us feel like we are the experts of everything. Um, and that is the idea of making people more comfortable with uncertainty. Like we tend to be very um, psychologically, all of us, it's not a, a clinical or pathological feature, but we tend to be very resistant to uh, not knowing what to do, not knowing what to think. Um, we like our experts to be the kind of people who kind of stamp their foot and have a clear, obvious opinion. We don't like experts who, um, you know, reveal the uncertainties of the world and, and say we have to wait for more evidence. But sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to wait for more evidence. So I think this sense that, you know, we are all doing our little bit and we cannot really get to a full picture without relying on other people's knowledge is super important. So making people feel very comfortable about something that philosophers would talk about in terms of epistemic humility. Like I'm not, I don't need to be an expert on everything to be able to make good decisions about my life. I need to respect that other people might know more than me on this particular matter and I need to be open to listening. Of course, that doesn't mean accepting, but at least listening. Um, so epistemic humility is a big thing and tolerance to uncertainty. Um, the realization that science doesn't give you answers, you know, automatically you ask the question and you get the answer. Uh, it, it may take sometimes decades to be able to answer satisfactorily a question that has been asked, especially if it's a new question. Making people more comfortable with that level of uncertainty, more comfortable with their own limitations, I think is important. And it can be, I think, empowering because the realization that we can do so much, even if we know so little, it can be phrased as something uplifting rather than something that makes us feel small and, and unable to cope. And when it comes to the issue of epistemic responsibility, to what extent do you think we should hold individual people responsible for their own delusional beliefs, since we also have this social component to delusions? So I think um, there is, I think it makes sense to talk about responsibility about our own beliefs, but only in a very qualified sense. Um, I think you know, we all go through a number of different hypotheses, sometimes even kind of completely crazy ones when we are considering um, what's happening in a new situation or what we are supposed to do. Um, and that initial exploration of, of, of potential options um, is something that uh, we shouldn't kind of um, hold against the person. I think it's, it's, it's absolutely fine and, and sometimes it's the best course of action to kind of consider different options and see what's out there. Um, there is a point in which we endorse a certain hypothesis as something that we are committed to. And I think um, that's also something that may happen um, in situations where, for instance, we don't have all the relevant knowledge available to us, that we endorse an explanation that is not very good. Um, I think being open, and again, this is part of epistemic humility, but being open to recognizing that we have been wrong in the past and change our mind is, is again, you know, the, um, what we would expect from an ideal epistemic agent. So that is not something that I think a person can do entirely on their own. So I think what is really important is to recognize that, that because we don't have, uh, we don't have access to all the relevant knowledge, uh, what kind of knowledge people have access to is something that is a societal responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of the individual. Um, even access to different narratives and ways of seeing the world and interpreting events is really important. So the kind of education that stimulates that, the respect for other ways of seeing the world, other perspectives, um, can really help with this idea of being more tolerant of diversity, more tolerant of uncertainties. And again, that's something that can come through education. Um, and, and education, I just don't, I, I don't mean just children, I mean education, long life education can comes from the way in which we are invited to think about certain issues and the kind of resources that we're given to think about those issues. Um, so I'm very reluctant to say that there is no individual responsibility 
because I think that would be very strongly disempowering. I think that we do exercise agency in the way in which we form and express and act on our beliefs. Um, and we have the capacity to recognize when a belief is not doing for us what we would expect it to do. At the same time, very often, due to psychological pressures, we do need support in being able to recognize what other belief would be available to us that would give us the same benefits and would not have the costs that are as high as the cost of the delusional belief. So the way I put it is that it's a little bit of everything that helps in this case. So you need to be able to kind of nurture certain types of skills and virtues in the individual um, that make sure that their own cognitive perspective on the world is actually something that serves them right and helps them to act in a way that enables them to pursue their own goals. At the same time, there needs to be a recognition that some people start advantaged in life and, uh, you know, already start with a lot of resources to be able to make those decisions. Other people need more support and support is needed throughout, though I think it's especially relevant in very early education to be able to see um, how we can um, become and more enamored with this idea that we are not like the lone explorer or the kind of superhero agent who saves everybody else. That's not where the value should be. The value should be in a group of people who help and support each other and everybody does something small, but together what they realize is something actually very big. And I think, um, you know, our way of seeing things, you know, kind of the special value that we give to, you know, the, the one scientist who makes a huge discovery is never one scientist. <laughs> it cannot be right. There needs to be so much backing them up um, that is important or the one kind of superhero saves the whole city. That's not feasible. That's never going to happen in real life. Um, we need to be more aware that resources need to be distributed and once they're distributed and people are supported, there is a much better um, likelihood that people will develop explanations that serve them well. And so that's also very related to one of the ideas you present in the book about agency in context, right? Yeah, yeah, that's basically the idea that um, we need to be able to express our agency and to pursue our goals, but we cannot do it in isolation from from other people, other groups and society at large. And so whatever we achieve, when it's something good or it's something bad, it's a shared responsibility between ourselves and who else has supported or undermined what we were trying to do. Great. So I think that would be a great point to end the interview on. The book is again, Why Delusions Matter. I'm leaving a link to it in the description box down below. And Dr. Bortolotti, just before we go, apart from the book, would you like to tell people where they can find your work on the internet? Yeah, so um, I've got uh, a website and most of my papers, uh, recent papers are open access and a lot of the papers that um, uh, reflect on aspects of the book have been published open access very recently. So you can just link and read and, and see whether you like them. And I'm quite active on social media as well. So um, if there is anything new that is, you know, being thought or developed, you will be sure to know it. Okay, great. So thank you so much again for coming on the show. I really love the book. So I hope that people from my audience run and buy it. It's a very interesting read. And thank you so much again for taking the time to, to come on the show. Thank you for all your insightful questions. That was great. Okay, run and buy it. It's a very interesting read. And thank you so much again for taking the time to, to come on the show. Thank you for all your insightful questions. That was great. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon and PayPal. The links are in the description down below. And also please share, like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons.
and PayPal supporters Perga Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunde, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenius, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Ruinasi, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Michael Stormier, Samuel Andre, Francis Forte, Agnunes, Fergal Cousin, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrand, John Linares, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hummel, Sadus France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Anik Punta, Radan Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stazewski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madsen, Gary G. Hallman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stiofanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Moray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheist, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Harrington, Starry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandin, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Paul Crowley's, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hurtner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings and David Pinsoff. A special thanks to my producers Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stefaniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Giancarlo Montenegro, Alni Cortes, Nick Golden and Rosie. And to my executive producers Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all. <laughs>